Welcome, everyone, to the Table podcast here at AGF. This is our third podcast. It's so excited to be with you. We have Pastor Lynn Shaw, we have Alex Sidabaka, myself, Pastor Rob, and we are going to continue the conversation that we've been having for a little bit. Specifically, we're going to talk about Lent today. We're in the season of Lent, but we're also going to go a little bit deeper into how can Lent help us to not just become like Christ in this season, but what can Lent do to help create some cool rhythms and habits or practices mm-hmm. or disciplines, whichever word you'd like to use, in your life? Mm-hmm. And so we're going to, right now, Pastor Lynn, I'll throw it back to you, and I would like for you to just maybe recap for us, um, what is Lent? What's the purpose of Lent? That's good. <clears throat> so Lent was, you know, in the life of the church when, when it was in its infancy, Lent evolved into a time frame of where they were looking at you know, Christ's 40 days that he went into the desert. And um, it became a time of reflection uh, to where we, first of all, we're faced with kind of our mortality. And the idea about that is that um, as Christians, we still struggle in the area of our flesh and mm-hmm. our carnal nature, right? And so Lent was a time to really kind of reflect, look look at ourselves, uh, a time of repentance. But, but the overall... Um, purpose for Lent was preparation for Easter, mm-hmm. to, to get us in a spot that, that when we roll into Easter, that we're ready, to, we're ready to just enter into the beauty of that season. And so Lent, you know, kind of three things about Lent is, is uh, extra prayer, right? We spend time prayer, praying, uh, reflecting, which can lead to repentance, um, and then fasting, denying ourselves. And then uh, generosity. The, the the King James biblical term is giving of alms, is just being more generous. And that's a good thing for all of us. Absolutely. You know, one of the things we've talked about throughout the last couple of podcasts is this idea of this is a season of creating an opportunity where we detach ourselves from our normal structure of lives, just this 40 days looking mm-hmm. up until Easter. And one of the quotes we've used a couple times, but it's John Mark Comer says, the solution to an over busy life is not more time. It's to slow down and simplify our lives around what really matters. And so for us, this is an opportunity to think about in the reflection, what really matters? And then what are we doing? Because sometimes what really matters and what we're actually doing don't look the same. So this is a good opportunity for that. So um, in that, Pastor Alex, maybe um, let's look at a perspective of in Lent. What has this looked like for you in Lent? And Mm -hmm. I don't want to be like the Pharisees that come and we've got, we look like we're so exhausted because we've been fasting and look at how great we are because we're super spiritual. So that's not the purpose of this (laughs) conversation, but I would like to get really practical today. Yeah. And just say, what what has Lent looked like maybe in the past? Mm-hmm. What does it look like for us right now? And what are some things, some practical suggestions that we could give to those, our audience that are listening right now, um, that what what we could do to actually detach ourselves from our current season mm-hmm. and put ourselves in the middle of Lent? What are some suggestions? Yeah, I mean, our first two podcasts have really kind of dived into the background of it. We've had conversations about why we practice it. So if there's, if you're in a position right now where you're watching this and you're like, I'm, I'm want to go deeper on this idea. I want to understand the background to it. I encourage you to listen to those first two, our, our first podcast being on the season of Lent, the second being on specifically uh, Ash Wednesday. And we dived into that specifics a little bit more on the history of it or the purpose within the church or within our own context. But today, I think some of the things that we've experienced since this has started is people coming up to us with like, like, hey, what does this look like in your life? How are you actually practicing yeah. this? Do I have to like fast all food? And at the beginning, we first said like, don't do that. In fact, we we don't recommend you just starve yourself for 40 days. That's not the purpose. Right. But I think some people, we really want to get to like the, okay, this is a good idea in pap- on paper, but what does it look like in practicality? Mm-hmm. Um, and so for me, I, I mean, I've even had students who've come up to me and say, you know, Pastor Alex, I'm interested but I'm not so sure that I'm comfortable like giving everything up. (laughs) Like, I don't, I don't know that I want to give up all food or am I supposed to fast all of the food every day? If I'd fast, does does it have to be a thing I do every day that in order for it to be considered a fast? And we've talked specifically about how our heart in this is to like really encourage people to remove something that they crave and to literally place in that space, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving so that our attention is drawn to God. So for me in practicality, um, this year I I chose to fast. Um, one of the things that I love most, and this is going to sound really, (laughs) really dumb, 
come. Come on, come clean. <laughs> this Tell is us. it. Uh, so I'm, I'm fasting meat on Wednesdays. Um, and the, it started because one of my favorite things I do is I hang out with some of my friends Wednesday night and I have Buffalo Wild Wings. Mm, and so good. I love this experience, even though myself the next day doesn't always love the experience. Yes. But uh, I love this experience. And so it's one of the things that I loved. And I knew that if I took away that chicken, that not the Lord's chicken, but just that chicken in general. <laughs> uh, and then I was like, all right, can I, can I take it a step further? Can I just fast all meat? And then we were at this conference in Colorado right before Ash Wednesday. And they were like, you know, it's really good to fast meat for a day, just in general. And I'm like, it doesn't sound <laughs> really good. And it's like one of those things in life where you don't realize how much you love something until you remove it. Mm-hmm. Like even me, I, I broke my pinky toe when I was in college running track and field. And I had no idea how much I used my pinky toe to balance myself when I walked. And so this thing, the first Wednesday happened and I was like, oh, this is going to be brutal. Like we went to Taco Bell and I got a veggie burrito and I only got one mm-hmm. of them. And I just remember thinking, this is a tragedy. Not that the rest of their food there has actual meat either. Almost but at least so in, in, in another season, <laughs> that could also force you to surrender a card. Yeah, oh, man, totally. maybe in a different totally. card, actually. Yeah, and so in, this, in the Lord season, I, I don't get to be, I don't have to sacrifice anything. But anyway, uh, so for me, that's what my, my fasting looks like. And in the past, I've fasted things like certain social medias. Like I've fasted YouTube or I'll fast, uh, I'll take Instagram and Facebook off of my stuff. And so I think for people, we have to understand, you know, one of the things we were talking earlier is that fasting in the traditional sense is food. But in this right. space, you can fast other things that point you to Jesus when you fast those things in that time. So for me, that's what my, my practices are. I'm curious what your guys' are and what they look like this year. You know, there, there could be some of you listening out there and, and maybe hear, hear a fasting of social media or whatever it may be. And maybe you come from a tradition or maybe you come from just knowledge that says, come on, is that really a fast? And, and, and kind of here's how, how we've talked about this, that... Um, yeah, what, what's clear is, is from the get-go of the church, fasting involved food. Mm-hmm. But, but I think if a person could pull back just a bit and look at a principle, and it's like when we deny ourselves something, that's wonderful. I, 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 I encourage anybody that maybe would start off by maybe fasting a, something that, fasting television or whatever it may be, um, yes, in a, in, a, in a very strict academic sense, uh, historical sense, uh, that probably wouldn't qualify as fasting. But I look at it this way. Anything that we can do in our culture, our culture is a culture that's all about me, right? And yeah. anything that we can do to combat selfishness yeah. and, and get ourselves to selflessness is a good thing. And so, you know, yeah, you might have kids and they might come to you and say, hey, I want to I wanna fast whatever it may be that might not involve food, I encourage you as a parent say, cool, because that's a primer. Yeah. That, that, that starts the idea in a person's mm-hmm. mind that, you know what, it's good for me to, de- to deny things that my flesh craves. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. good. So it's a good thing. Yeah, it, cute little story, and I won't say which one of my children who is my middle son that did this. So, but um, we'll never know. We'll never know. So we've been celebrating Lynn as a family for a few years now, and so he was younger. And I remember at the very end of Lent, we were talking about, "Wow, what are some of the things that God's done in your life, and mm-hmm. and where have you been?" And we were with my mom, and my mom said, "Well, cool. What are you going to do next year?" And Lent's not even over yet. Yeah. And we're having this conversation. We kind of go around the room, and my daughter says something, and my other son says something, and then this son says you know, next year, I think I'm going to give up Lent. (laughs) That's not what we're talking about from self-denial, but it's a cute little story to show. Um, I really do think, and um, maybe this is a shift in in where we're going with this, but um, Paul talks a lot in the epistles about putting down the desires of the flesh, right? He talks a lot, um, Romans 13, 14 says, but put on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. And we could read a bunch of other scriptures. And some of you might be watching right now and you're still on the fence of, is this Lent thing okay? Mm -hmm. Should we even do it? Does this just feels like legalism? Mm -hmm. And maybe let's just talk about that for a moment on a very real level. What does that look like to... We talked about this in our very first podcast, run the race in such a way that we can win it. So Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, Pastor Lynn, I've heard you talk a lot about is you use the example of professional athletes. Maybe share with our audience where you come from from that perspective. 
Yeah. You know, I think it's just a good metaphor because there's, all of us have a sport probably that we like um, or, or, or anything that's kind of done on an elite level and done really well. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think every Christian, you know, would at least on the outside say, man, I don't want to do this Christian thing, sort of. I want to be really good at it. And, and what I mean by really good at it is I want to be, I want to... I want my life to be transformed into the image mm-hmm. of Christ. And I think every Christian, that's at our heart. I think what we then have to ask ourselves, what, what are we willing to do to get there? And, and on the topic of Lent, it, 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 you know, if you could look at doing Lent on a world-class sports level, so then maybe there would be, there would maybe be some strict fasting in terms of food and, and, and some other disciplines that a person might put in place. Mm-hmm. And I just look at it, you know, I'm not a world-class athlete. Mm-hmm. Um, but if I want to get there, I need to look to other world-class athletes and see how they did it and go, if I do the same thing, maybe it can get me further along the way. And I think that's, I think that's just a good way for us as, as believers to, to look at this, that, that this is a discipline that can help us further our journey in God to mm-hmm. where we do, uh, that we, we're growing into the image of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the good. image of Christ, I want to be like Christ, and I know I know you guys want to be like Christ, and it's like, yeah. you know, so how, whatever's you know, use the that kind of that movie baby steps, whatever baby yeah. steps mm-hmm. we can take to get us closer, yeah, all the better. That's good, and that's what we want to do in these podcasts. We don't want to just share some practice with you. Mm-hmm. We really want to give you some practical steps, and what do those steps look like? And so for me, this is that's a great metaphor a great picture that um, I am not a pro athlete, okay? Mm-hmm. I love sports, but if I were to go play football with some of my favorite people that are football players and people that are pro athletes, I would get rocked, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so for me, use that as a metaphor for us as Christians. Some of you out there might be like, man, I, I'm i not a pro Christian. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, that's not the point of this to become mm-hmm. the pro Christian. But in a way, we can say, where are we in this walk? Mm-hmm. So, yep. Do we want to grow And do further? we want to grow further? Yeah. yeah so maybe sure. you couldn't go run a marathon mm-hmm. on a whatever level right now, and that's okay. So we want to maybe give you some steps that would say, what is that baby step? Yeah. What can I do? What are the things that I can do? Could it be on Wednesdays, I'm not going to eat meat, mm-hmm. right? Can that be a step for you that, that helps you to get to a spot that says, okay, I am going to delay this gratification and this flesh, and I'm going to put this down. Mm-hmm. And then you start growing in that and you go, wow, you know what? Thank you, God. You helped me yeah. through that. And now I believe I can do something more. Yeah. And I think two things really quick with that. One is that I think it's really important that as Christians, we don't judge where we're at in our race based on other people. Like if I wanted totally. to look at Pastor Lynn, I know he's done 40 day fast. And I'm not going to look at myself. And, and if you heard at the beginning, and maybe you were like, oh, Pastor Alex is only, you know, fasting meat on Wednesdays. What a baby Christian he is. Like, like <laughs> that wasn't the you point of that just comment. Been like, you could have easily checked me out of your entire equation of holiness just because you oh, could brother. measure it, right? And so I want to be clear for some people, like, yeah. uh, it, it, you can't get into that. And I had a student who they're like, if I just fast, like, I've never fasted ever before. Could I start with this? And yeah. like Pastor Lynn is saying, it's the point is to start. Like, can you start with something? Yep. Right. And like next year, maybe my thing grows, but the goal is that we're growing in our faith, right? Mm-hmm. If I looked at Rob and I know Rob has fasted meat for an entire season of Lent before, and I could sit down and be like, man, I'm not there. And it, it's not about that. And I just mm-hmm. want to kind of give it from a pastoral perspective that yeah. our heart is not to come to you and be like, man, wait until you've reached this level of holiness. It's not so you can measure your Absolutely. sanctity not against someone all. else's either, yep. but it's an opportunity for us to say, am I growing? And for you, if growth is this year that you started fasting one thing in your life that you loved and that's something you craved and that during that time you focus your attention on God, you know, it, then it's a win. And then totally. if next year you can grow some way in that, then it's a win. Like yep. for me, fasting was always previously about getting something, right? Because I would fast and pray when I was needing something desperately, right? But this year it's just like in this whole season as we as a church have walked through the season of Lent together, it's a very new practice of just taking 40 days to not have something just mm-hmm. for the sake of pursuing Christ in that season. Yeah. Uh, so this is a different attachment for me, mm-hmm. even as like a pastor. And I know that that could be disappointing to some, but for others, it's a new thing. And so hopefully that can relate to some of you. And the 
the good news, I'll share a cool testimony. The next day, my wife and I went to Buffalo Wild Wings for our date night, and we you got half meat. off the chicken Look because on you. Thursdays, it's buy one, get one free. So, <laughs> you, you know, the Lord provides, and it makes a way. Oh, man. So I, I'm, I'm just saying, like, I think that's important to catch that it's not about measuring whether or not you're as far along yeah. as someone else is. You know, the, the, the ancient fathers, I, I just love, I, I love how they talk about what, what fasting should produce. So, so many, maybe like at one time in Pastor Alex's life, fa- fasting was to get something. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the ancient father says that fasting was to create in us mm. a remembrance of mm. how hungry we want to be for God. So, so that when, when you're giving up something and it comes that time, that Wednesday, that you would normally whatever, and you give that up, let it just be a, a tick in your brain that just goes, that's right. You know what? I want to have that same passion yeah, that same for God. And, you know, so a practical thing that, that I've done this year that I haven't done in the past, in addition to other things that I've done, is, you know, m- kind of my rhythm in the morning looked, l- looked a certain way. And um, so I'd get up in the morning and, you know, start getting ready for the day. And one of the things that I always liked to do is I'd, I like to just would check at some point in the morning. It wasn't the first thing that I did, but it was a prominent thing that I did. I I kind of wanted to check the news of the day. So instead, what I've been doing is I have an app on my phone that I downloaded on purpose so that a a set of the Psalms and some prayers would come up. Mm -hmm. And so in my normal time that I would normally would have looked at the headlines of the day, Mm -hmm. my day, in in fact, this morning, it was this really... Because I... So I did both on my phone, mm-hmm. and um, this, this this morning um, I mistakenly uh, went to a different app, and and I couldn't get off of that app quick enough yeah. to hear mm-hmm. our Father who art in heaven, mm-hmm. hallowed be that. You know, yeah. it, and it, it's become now just a part of my. And we're only how far are we are we into Lent? Fifteen yeah. days. Yeah, yeah, not we're not very far into it, but for me, it's already. I I I, I can't wait to go through some of those prayers. I, I, I pray Psalms fifty, mm. and some of the the Psalms I pray every morning that I never have done before regularly. But that's just an idea. It's like okay, Love if that. you normally do something, maybe maybe just try something else. If if you would normally spend five minutes doing yeah. something, maybe go. You know what, God, I'm going to give that five minutes to you and. And read a psalm. I, I you know, so whatever good. it may be. I yeah. just think anything that we can move ourselves that way, it's going to help us. Yeah, and and I think sometimes we can get so legalistic about mm. things. And I think legalism comes. This is my own perspective, and I'd love to hear from you guys on this. But I think legalism happens when we forget the purpose behind what we're doing. Mm-hmm. So, in other words, we we start a discipline, and the discipline, the purpose of the discipline, is to become like Christ. Mm-hmm. But before you know it, it becomes more about the discipline than it does becoming yep. like Christ. And so, and we're human beings. We're great at that. Aren't we're really we? good at that. Taking something and, that's life giving yeah. and then just turn it into a <laughs> taking all the good out of it. I, yeah, yeah, exactly. Totally. <laughs> and I think as long as we're humans, which is going to be as long as we're alive, alive right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I have to check myself on that. <laughs> as so long are we going to be a human <laughs> after we're not alive? I think we're going to be a human after we're alive okay, as well. Let's go down a Great question. Road. That's a rabbit trail. But Rob canceled on there the most is, obscure thing. There it is. But, but I do think that there's a good reminder that every time... So what can be very easy is to just get in this pattern that says, oh, I looked at the news. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm a bad person. Yeah. That's not the purpose. That's not the point. It's yeah, not no. that you're bad because you broke a fast. That's mm-hmm. not the whole purpose at all. I think to very quickly then get back to that spot like you did that was like, oh, man, that helps me to remember, God, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He yeah. makes me to lie. And it just leads us in a different way. So you can definitely get legalistic. You could get legalistic. We celebrate here at Amazing Grace Communion every single Sunday. Mm-hmm. So we've had comments from people that say, man, why do we have to celebrate every single week? And you say the same scripture every single week. And I, I think that's a good thing to address yeah. because ultimately the, the power is not removed because of the amount of times that we do it. The power is removed because we forget the purpose behind yeah. it and we make it legalistic. Yeah, it's in, interesting when people go down that road, it's like, but we sing every Sunday. So mm-hmm. are we just legalistic and sing? So let's just stop. Then you could go, well, we... Preach. preach a sermon every yeah. Sunday, so let's stop that too. It's like you yeah. know all of these all of these worshipful acts. 
are in place and it's we're the arbiters mm-hmm. of whether or not it's life giving or it's dead tradition. Yeah. yeah. And that's isn't that just the work of serving God? Yeah. That that I have to keep remembering I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that yeah. he that he died for me, that he rose again, and Constantly just got to keep that. getting that purpose back, and that's what keeps it life giving. How do you guys stay fresh in that way? I mean, that's a, maybe a, maybe a bad way of saying it, but what are because as pastors, we preach every week. We're we're in church constantly, right? Yep. And so I'm sure it's not just for us as people. Like everybody deals with this. We deal with this. There are times where I've had to come to myself and just be like, all right, Alex or Soul, <laughs> like yep. get my own self into place. But like, yes, just because I've heard uh, you know Pastor Lynn preach X number of times, I, I can't just check out because he's such a voice I've heard it's so much. It's just so Pastor you know? Lynn again. Yeah, I mean, yeah, right. I, I edit his sermons. I, I do the things like I've heard Pastor Lynn. Preach preach. And it can be possible where you hear somebody speak or you get into the practice of these different things. Like, so what are some ways that you guys, I guess, keep those things sacred in your lives? For me, um, I, I had my shoulder replaced this, this year. And, um, I got to a place in my rehabilitation that I just got tired of it. Mm. Um, cause it was hard. It was painful. And it, it was a great life lesson for me because then um, I had to ask myself, but what's your goal? Mm. And so then that, that, that brings me to Hebrews, seeing that we're compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses. Mm-hmm. Um, let's keep our eye on the prize, right? And that's not what that verse actually says, but seeing that we're compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let's, let's keep in front of us. Mm-hmm. The goal. And mm-hmm. then it says Jesus had to keep a goal. He said, who for the joy that was set before him? Mm-hmm. So for me, what brings me back, Alex, to go from, can this just be going through it, yeah. the road, versus life's giving? It's like, no, that prize, that that goal of, of, of growing into that image of Christ, it's like... That that in, that compels me mm, to yeah. work through. For me, it was my shoulder. I wanted to get to where I could lift my hand mm-hmm. all the way. I wanted to get to where somebody looking at me, I didn't. They wouldn't go, "Oh, what's wrong with his shoulder?" Yeah, it's like that's where I want to go. And yeah, and as good. a Christian, that goal before me, I hope it's a goal before you too. That says, you know what, I want to be like Christ. And so it's like, okay, so that's this is something that'll get me there. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna do it. What about That's you, Rob? Good. How do you keep them, some spiritual practices fresh in your heart? Yeah, so actually I think this might, you might disagree with me. Some of you who are listening who are <laughs> like, oh, this whole spiritual disciplines thing is whatever. Um, mm-hmm. I think the power sometimes is in the spiritual disciplines themselves mm-hmm. that help. They put something in place. For example, like fasting. Mm-hmm. Fasting produces hunger. Yep. I'm hungry. And so I, I think we could look at fasting as like, well, what's the power in that? That's goofy. Why are, like, what are you getting out of fasting? And number one, I don't think that that's the point of getting something out of it. However, mm-hmm. when we fast and we're hungry, it produces something called hunger, mm-hmm. which gives me an opportunity to make a decision. Mm-hmm. And that decision is I'm going to eat something or I could remo- change my focus to the purpose behind the discipline mm-hmm. that helps me to recognize I need to be hungry for Christ. Mm-hmm. And so I believe every spiritual discipline, which we're going to dive into a couple more here in just a minute, but I think every spiritual discipline, that's the power of what the early church was doing, utilizing things like disciplines because they're very practical but they're also physical things. They affect you. And as they affect you, for example, silence and solitude, Mm -hmm. we could sit there in silence and just be in our own head, or we could recognize that that silence is meant for something and that there's a purpose behind that silence. And that Mm -hmm. silence has something that we can glean from, or we can just mm, be weird like (laughs) some Eastern. we could take a nap during. We could take a nap during, sure. But you you know what I'm saying. I I, I really do think so. I kind of said this already, but I think going back to the heart or the purpose behind a discipline, number one, like you said, reminds us it keeps our our eye on that goal. But then the disciplines are in place for a purpose. And they're powerful and they're awesome. And they've been in place for 2,000 plus years. And as a matter of fact, things like fasting have been in place before that. Mm. And, you know, we, we, we do this intuitively in life. Um, <clears throat> Rob, you're a drummer. You've, mm-hmm. you've been in the studio. Um, and you've listened to other people. And, and you've maybe just 
uh, anecdotally or just informally talk to great drummer, drummers about what they do, and they mm -hmm. might offer some stuff. And and then you'll weigh those things. And 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 Alex, you've you know you're you're really good at media. I know you've watched a ton of videos on on how other people craft things. Mm -hmm. And we we do this in sports. It's like oh, what, so so so, you know, especially when we go golfing. You'd never know that I've listened to anybody. But by the way, I golf. But you go golfing, and you'll you'll listen to somebody else about maybe a practice that they do that got them where they are. Mm -hmm. And we'll go. You know what? I'm going to do that in the area of finances, right? Dave Ramsey stuff. It's like we would be an idiot if we would listen to stuff like that and go, well, I don't think there's anything behind it. Mm -hmm. And one thing that the church has that we can look at is we can look at 2,000 years of men and women who became spiritual giants. Yeah. And when we look at some of the disciplines that they did, I think we would be, I'm not going to call us an idiot, I think we would be really Amiss. shallow to think that there's nothing Mm. that that would have to offer us. It's like, you know, wow, it's interesting. All this set of guys and ladies, our, our forefathers in the faith, man, they incorporated these things in their life. Isn't that amazing? They all did. But you know what? In day and day, I just don't, I just don't buy it. Mm -hmm. I think we would be silly to just dismiss it. Yeah. yeah. And it's in good. each of those areas, right, everyone in, who's a professional or who's considered the best doesn't stop practicing once they've achieved it. Total. Right? So, like, you could say in, in the drumming world or in the golfing world or in the basketball, and you, you name it, right? Whether it's piano. No, that, basketball <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't work for me. I suck. <laughs> I totally suck. I'm just saying, like, whatever your thing is, like, each of us yep. can say very clearly, like, for me, I know that if I was to ever arrive as the best, it wouldn't be because I had grown comfortable with it. It'd be kind of, it's because I've grown the discipline of practicing it, there right? And in my faith, the same thing is true, right? I'm wanting to create a discipline of practicing yep. my faith. Mm -hmm. And I think that these are true of the ways that you guys are saying, from what I'm hearing from you at least, are the ways that you keep things fresh is that you have disciplines of practice yep. that right. are in place. And it's when you practice, when, when the discipline of practicing is what you do consistently, then it's always fresh, yeah. right? Like it's because yeah. we, we recognize we're not, the thing is that you're not, you're practicing, meaning you haven't arrived, Right? Like, and all of us are in that space. None of us have achieved, and, and no matter how holy or spiritual you may feel you are, maybe you've done a 40 day fast multiple times, or maybe this is your first year and you gave up chicken nuggets. Like, I don't, I don't care where you are in the spectrum, right? Are you practicing? Are yeah. you, do you have a discipline of practice in your life that says, I, I, I set before me this race, this goal, this prize that I'm going to pursue, and that's my relationship with God that I'm never going to arrive, but I'm going to constantly pursue and practice these things in my and life. And it's pursued from a place of humility, because yeah, I was just good. thinking while you were talking, that's Pastor good. Alex, I, um, I don't know if you've, been, if you've heard of a guitar player called Tommy Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. I personally think he's one of the greatest guitar players living. What's interesting is I, I got to ask him a few questions personally. And he practices just, and, and I, I said, so when you, when you practice, are you practicing a song? He said, if, if I'm getting ready to learn a new song, I do. But he goes, I, I, I practice scales and stuff. I said, how long? He goes, two to four hours every day. Hmm. And, and if you were to think of anybody hmm. in your world that you, that, that you respect, th this morning I heard Roy McElroy talk about uh, just where he was in his golf. And here he, here, here he is, you know, one of the top ten, one of the greatest. Right? Yeah. One of the greatest, and it's like he did. He, and he said this. He goes, you know, I just need to get on the putting green and putt a little bit more. Yeah, and I'm sitting good. there, this thinking, what I wouldn't give to have his putting ability. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, and so, and, and but what here's what you hear out of everyone who's who's accomplished great things at, at a skill or a craft is they all say this: I still have so much more to learn. Totally. And, and it, isn't that way in our Christian walk? We're never going to arrive on this side of glory. It's always going to be a thing that we can, we can keep growing. Yeah, yeah, and when I was in college, the same thing was true. Like, you talk to these professors who studied the Bible for their whole lives, or these high esteemed academic individuals, and the more people know about something, the less they realize they know. Totally. So I think the same thing can be true in our faith, is if humility is not present, then you realize they don't know that much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, is that the giveaway? <laughs> if you think that you know it all, then you really don't know anything. It's those who know the yeah. most who are usually telling you how little they know. It's because they realize the spectrum of what exists. Yeah, that's good. I think it was Tony Dungy in one of his books, talking about going back to the basics. Yeah. And he takes over this team that's a horrible team. They're just not playing well, bottom of the whatever in their division. Poor Colts. 
Oh, I was trying not to say it, but I don't like the Colts anyway, I mean, so there Tony they are. Junji, Let's be honest. The yeah, so he comes into this team, and they're awful, and what does he start doing? He starts practicing the basics. Mm-hmm. How do you hand the ball off? With professionals, With professionals yeah. that were drafted, <laughs> Who that should paid know. millions of dollars, yeah. that should know these things. Yep. But he took this team, and instead of practicing all of these very, very difficult skills – went back to the basics and got solid on that. So he makes the point that when you work on the foundations and the basics, that's when you can grow and learn more. And only. And and only then. only when. That's right. And I think for us as Christians, sometimes it's like, man, I want this, and I want to be the giant slayer, and I want whatever. (laughs) And we we have this picture in our mind. But we've, we've been talking about this, so I think it's still a great example. The pro athletes, the ones that are phenomenal, are the ones that still go back and practice the basics. Oh, yeah. And to me, these principles of getting in God's word, praying, mm-hmm. fasting, Sabbath, yeah. silence and solitude, these, these principles of meditating on God's word, getting in a quiet place, mm-hmm. that will never, ever be something that we, we shouldn't go back to. That'll yeah. never be something that yeah. you're above or you that you're over that. or that you've graduated <laughs> from and you get yeah. to go or to the next level. In, to use, uh, uh, to use um, a verbiage that we hear so much today, you, you, there's some things in God you never innovate your way out of. Oh, there you okay. go. Yeah. You, That's cool. You, you, you can't. You, you, there's, I, in fact, I heard an old, I, I was, while you were talking, Rob, I was trying to remember his name and I can't, but Christianity is the one sphere mm. that innovation doesn't fly. Hmm. Yeah. Prayer is prayer. The word of God is the word of God. It's not going to be innovated. It's it's yeah. not going to change. What we have is what we have. Mm. And human beings are still human beings. We're still carnal. We still hold this treasure in an earthen vessel. Yeah. And the way to move forward in that growth in God is by just in and of themselves prayer is basic. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And, and fasting really is, ba- denying ourselves really is basic. But to do it consistently in a mm-hmm. life-giving way, that's where the rub comes, right? And, yeah. and that's where we just have to continually e- urge each other on. I, I, think, I think there's stuff that we can do with our own decisions, mm. but it's also nice to be able to have guys around, or people around us, our spouses, our children, to help egg us on yeah. to, you know, to help That's cheer good. us on down yeah. the road and say, hey, we can do this. This yeah. is what we're called to do. And each of those practices, they really, I mean, if you look at it, like they, none of them are require you to have any kind of prior experience, right? All yeah. of them actually point to you removing yourself from the picture, mm-hmm. right? Fasting is not you being good at eating. <laughs> it's being you being good at not. <laughs> like, you know, praying isn't yeah, you being an good. eloquent speaker. It's you being a good listener, right? And and even the almsgiving is not being you good at earning something. It's being you good at giving it away. And I yep. love how each of these practices don't point to our, like, abilities. I think sometimes we grow really, and I get it. I understand why. I, I have the same problem. I'm sure all of us have gotten to this place, but we look at it and we're like, man, I really want that spiritual gift. And I really want to see that God move in that way. And then we have these moments every year where we come back and be like, yeah, but can you just sit with God? Mm-hmm. Yep. Can you give it all away for a minute? Can you just yep. pray and listen? Can you talk to God? Great. But can you just listen to God? Like um, sure. one of the things my grandma always had the sign in her, in her bedroom, it was the guest bedroom. And I remember it says he who, uh, and this was for me, obviously, um, <laughs> who thinks by the inch, uh, but talks by the yard deserves to be kicketh by the foot. Right. <laughs> and I remember that statement and my grandma never told me it. She just put it in the wall so that it would sink into my head. On the wall that you always <laughs> that, that agreed. I always yeah. And, and to be to my grandma's credit, I know this was not a personal thing. So grandma, if you're watching, I know that you weren't calling me out and she's a sweet, sweet woman. But like all this to say, like that, that's true. Right. And yeah. in this season, we can get that space of like, hey, God isn't looking for more from me. He's not a, it's not a grading session about your holiness levels or how spiritually mature you are. It's like, man, if you can do the basic things well, if you can hand the ball off well, if you can do these primary foundational true things well, this is what's going to show true life. Yeah. This is what's going to bring real. And it's not about what is pouring out of you, but like this is where God pours into you, is in you actually not demonstrating your holiness and goodness, but recognizing and leaning into his. And I love that. And that's where there's a rhythm. I think God created... God created creation with a rhythm in mind. I mean, Mm -hmm. we've got four seasons. There's never a year that we go with two seasons. 
you know, there's, 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 four, I understand. In Idaho, we might have eight. <laughs> yeah. Right. We often cycle. Or one that Fake goes spring. on forever. <laughs> yeah. But, but we all get, okay, the, the, the sun rises uh, every 24 hours and it sets every 24 hours. It, yep. it, it never, it never rises from the West and switches. It never gets innovative yeah. and does something different. It's like, why do we got to do it the same way? There's, there's 365 days in a year. Hmm. There's, there's rhythms in life. And, and the, the next kind of discipline, you know, besides silence and solitude is, is a discipline of six on and one off. Mm-hmm. Six on and one off. We call the one off a Sabbath, a time. And that's, that's a, I think that's a rhythm that God created for humanity because the Sabbath was made for man yeah. to where we can, okay, we, we can go hard for mm-hmm. six and then we recharge and we rest and we worship. And, yeah. and one could look at it and go, well, why can't we go nine? It's like, well, you could, <laughs> but there's a rhythm that God put into place. And, and, and then if you look at it from a bigger picture, a rhythm of a yearly Lent, Lenten time mm-hmm. that takes 40 days that we, we look at ourselves before the Lord to prepare our hearts for Easter, falling into that rhythm as opposed to bucking it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. the, the rhythm is what also produces the goodness and, yeah. and the growth and the, the whatever. Yeah, and you know, my personality, <clears throat> I'll say this years ago, probably 20 years ago, I read a book. I don't even remember who the author was, but the book was called um, Forget Everything. And the whole point behind it is just push back against the system, blow it all up, and start from, from the beginning. Oh, that explains a lot. I know, it does, doesn't it? And you know what? My, my personality, that is my personality. I want to... I'm a I'm an eight. I'm a challenger. So mm. for those of you who don't know what that is, that's the Christian horoscope. There it it's is. Called an you figure it out. It's the enneagram. <laughs> um, I want credit for that joke, by the way. <laughs> there it is. I want some credit for that joke. But I'm an I'm an eight. I'm a challenger. So I like challenging the system. Yeah. And um, one of the things that I've had to learn in this is, okay, it's good to challenge it because I think it's you can challenge something and make mm. sure that there's a foundation to it. But you mentioned this earlier, and I think it's powerful. There's 2,000 years of challenging this. Mm -hmm. So these disciplines that are in place are disciplines that have been challenged time after time after time. Mm -hmm. And I think it could be um, maybe a little bit unhumbling of myself, if I want to say it that way, if I want to say it that way, um, that says that I've got a better way. I can do it differently. It's arrogance. It is arrogance. And one of the things that we've recognized, and maybe this is a different angle of this, this conversation, but... Um, we read many of the the early fathers of the church that talk about how community is the only way to do disciplines. Hmm. So sometimes when it comes to the idea of prayer, we think about my own prayer closet, and I want to get in my time with yeah. Jesus and my personal one-on-one with Jesus. And I think all of those things are positive, yeah. and I think that there's a necessity for those things. But the church looked at from day one that we are a community of believers, and that's one of the things that's powerful me for me about Lent is we're celebrating Lent, not just me, Rob, off on my own with my family doing my own thing, but we're celebrating with a couple billion people. Mm-hmm. And we're celebrating, if I could even say it this way, with the saints that are, have gone before us mm-hmm. and those that are around the throne of God in heaven. And so, Pastor, I don't know if that's, if that's something that you want to speak to on that, but I, I think that we are celebrating and participating Lent as a community. And we're also participating as a larger body, and yeah. there's something really powerful about that. There is it, it, it. It's a it's a group identity, and what I mean by that is this: this is our family, right? Um, we all can look look in our own uh, biological families, and but the body of Christ is a family of God, mm-hmm. and. One thing for sure is that during this time, there's there's an incredible amount. It's it's maybe not a it's, it's certainly not a hundred percent, but there's a lot of, of of my family and of your family mm-hmm. globally that are yeah. have entered into. So so what's crazy is I've I've talked to some people actually over the last couple of weeks from different states or whatever, and we've talked about the season that we're in. Mm. And and there's a commonality that is, is really a helpful thing. Maybe yeah. some would call it even a positive peer pressure. 
Yeah. That that's a that's a cool deal. That, that it's yeah. a group identity that that binds our hearts together. Yeah. It encourages me on those days that I really want to eat that chicken wing. That's not me, but it is. That's me. every day for me too. So you know, you're right though. There's I accept what I am. I know what I'm about. <laughs> we we were in Denver at the Denver airport on Ash Wednesday. And there was something cool. We're sitting eating dinner and this guy and his wife walk by and they both have ashes on their forehead on Ash Wednesday. Yeah. And there was something special about it for me that I, I didn't just go, oh, cool. There was yeah. something special for me that was like, we're in Denver, Colorado mm. and they're celebrating the same thing we're celebrating. Yeah. We're on the same page in many ways. It's one of those things that can unify. And one of the things I just wanted to touch base on that I think is, is important is these disciplines can become something that makes us um, also selfish, or it could be something that brings us together as the body of Christ. Sure. And, uh, Bonhoeffer, who Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, one of the books that he wrote that I read recently was The Cost of Discipleship. Mm. And one of the things that he, he wrote in there that I just thought was really powerful is uh, that the, the practices we put in place are to love God and to love our neighbor. They're not just rules to be strict for no other reason. Never forget the purpose behind the disciplines. Yep. And we can very easily do that. So for me, I was thinking about this. When it comes to the idea of silence and solitude, if I want to be a better father and husband and pastor, I need silence and solitude. Yeah. That's not just for me to become this spiritually strong whatever that I get to do whatever I want to we have to put it in the context that we are called into a community and we're called to be the body of Christ for those that are around us. Mm -hmm. And there's something powerful that says, this is one of the things that he says that I, I thought was great, but um, withdrawing to the desert or to a quiet place yep. isn't about getting away from gross people. Hmm. God does not save us from people, but for people. Yep. Yeah. And I thought that was really powerful. powerful. So maybe, maybe for just a moment, um, how has discipline, spiritual disciplines, led us or helped lead us to reaching and to loving people better? Putting you all on the spot right now on that. For me, um, you realize when, when we, you know, uh, the Lenten season, when you, when you really look at your humanness you you arrive instantly at the fact that you have a knowledge that that I'm limited mm. um, I'm a human and what that that may that may sound sort of philosophical but for me what it does is it helps me then you know the the neighbor down the street the person I come in contact is also human so I have an instant commonality there you go that I can that I can relate to and um, just because we're born again and we love Jesus, we're humans who are born again mm. and love Jesus. And mm -hmm. we have a treasure within us that's an eternal treasure, which is wonderful. But it, but it, I don't know, it, it, it grounds me. I think sometimes we, we as Christians can have an, this idea with those that, who don't know Christ, kind of an us-them yeah, mm -hmm. mentality. And, and I abhor that. I, yeah. I, it's like, you know what? I just happen to be... I just happened to have had people in my life that shared the gospel with me. Yeah. And, and I, was, I was privileged to be able to get to know Jesus when mm -hmm. I was young. And, and coming face to face in the Lenten season for me with my mortality, mm -hmm. I'm human, I'm limited, it grounds me to every other human. Puts us all on the same it playing field, in, doesn't in, it? In a place that just goes, oh, mm -hmm. so I want them to know Jesus too, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, I, I, so I realize this isn't, um, he's not a Christian author, but I'm, you, so many people are probably familiar with the book Atomic Habits, right? Yep. And so uh, this book, there's a chapter in chapter two, actually, where it talks about um, outcome-based habits and the three layers of behavior change. And they have like a kind of an outward circle, an inward circle, and then a center space. And um, I'll give you a couple of quotes from it because I thought it was, speaks to this a lot. It says, behind every system of action are a system of beliefs. And behavior that is incongruent with the self will not last. And it goes on 
It says it's hard to change your habits if you never change the underlying beliefs that led to your past behavior. Mm -hmm. The ultimate form of intrinsic motivation is when a habit becomes a part of your identity. It's one thing to say, I'm the type of person who wants this. It's something very different to say, I'm the type of person who is this. And true behavior change is identity change. You might start a a habit because of motivation, but the only reason you'll stick with one is that it becomes part of your identity. Improvements are only temporary until they become a part of who you are. And it goes on to say this little list, and I thought it was interesting. The goal is not to read a book. The goal is to become a reader. Mm -hmm. The goal is not to run a marathon. The goal is to become a runner. The goal isn't to learn to play an instrument. It's to become a musician. And the same thing in our faith, and in response to your question, is to say like, okay, so this isn't a Christian application, but this is applicable within our Christian faith, is to say, is my goal to become a follower of Christ? Is that my identity? Are these just a list of things I do during the season, or is my goal to become a follower of Christ. And I mm-hmm. look at Jesus's behavior. I'm not looking at a, well, it's this kind of, you're putting all these, you know, legalistic things upon me. Like, no, is, what is your goal? Is that your identity? Is, is your identity become a follower of Christ? And these things should become in place that you are reaching the people around you. When you mm-hmm. look at the way Jesus led his life, it wasn't that Jesus went off and had the habit of being alone. And then yeah. when he saw people, he was like, oh man, I know all of your guys' problems. Like, I wish you knew sinners. how yeah, much I knew exactly. about all of your problems. Instead, Jesus saw the people hurting, knowing all the reasons that he couldn't or chose could choose not to help them, but he didn't lead with that. He led with compassion and mercy and love. In the same way, I think these habits and these, these disciplines in this season lead us to expressions outwardly of love because at the inward part, the reason behind all of these dis- disciplines is the identity of being a follower yeah. of Christ. The thing that you you earlier in, in what you were quoting it, it talked about belief and behavior. Mm-hmm. And isn't it true that all of us as Christians want the, want the results of a life in Christ? Yeah. But humanly speaking, we think that we can get it without having his lifestyle. Yeah. And, and yeah. his lifestyle is what produced the life. And if we think we can circumvent that yeah, that's and just get to the results, yeah. man, I just want this abundant life. Yeah. It's like, okay, that's available. And, you know, or to use the yoke is easy, my yoke is easy, my burden is like, to get there, we got to adopt his lifestyle. And, and what Christ had in spades. Mm-hmm. Was a was a lifestyle that that involved spiritual disciplines that 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 put you to a place that's good. Yeah, and I think one of the questions sometimes east the Easter that's not the one the egg or the chicken which one comes first <laughs> which right? came first the Easter or the which egg? one comes first the Easter Easter the egg. Easter came first there it is the chicken or the egg and so there's a question on this but at the same time I I'm gonna try to answer it I think um, we need to have the heart of Christ before we can have the practices of Christ, yeah. but the practices of Christ produce the heart of Christ. Well, and so this idea of spiritual disciplines, I think it's about aligning our heart to Christ through our practices. Mm-hmm. And our practices are what shows us the heart of Christ. And so Jesus didn't come to earth and look at all of these gross sinners and ooh. No, that was the point. Yeah, The mm-hmm. point was mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. And so even for us... the. Our, our point of doing spiritual disciplines is to become like Christ. I think it might even be deeper than that mm. to say that the whole purpose behind it is the point of solitude and silence, the point of Sabbath, the point of those, soon, those things is to align our heart with the heart of Christ that he loves people. Mm. He wants to have not only relationship with us, but with the entire world. Yeah. And if we could align our heart with Christ, then we become more like Christ. Right. And as we do the things that Christ did and the examples and the habits, and we do those practices that he did, I believe that our heart also begins to align with the heart of Christ, which is he loved people. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. to do these and come out the other side not loving people, yeah. we can just say, you did it wrong. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's just Christian faith in general. Totally. If you can yep. walk this faith and you at the end of it, you have a disdain for the people who come in. I mean, I, I'm sure you guys have heard the story of the pastor who like, brand new was hired on into church and he decided for weeks to like not shower, to not bathe, to just let his hair grow out, his beard grow out. And then he showed up at the church. It was his first Sunday. They were introducing him as a pastor. I don't know if this story is true, but I love the the message it gives. Right. And uh, then he came in and he looked like a homeless person and everyone kept their distance because he smelled and no one talked to him because he looked poor and dejected and people kept their distance because they're like, I don't want him to ask me for money and all these things. And then they introduced him as the pastor. And when he stood up, every 
everyone in the whole room, they're just, their gut dropped. They were good. They're like, yep. oh, that's the guy I looked the other way when I yeah. saw him because I didn't want to yeah. have to deal with his problems. And so at the end of this race, if we're doing those things, we're missing the point. Yeah, yeah. I love that. That's good. One of our, our uh, connections that all three of us knows is a guy in Colorado Springs, Andrew Arndt. And I'm going to just read one of the things that he said. Mm -hmm. um, Silence and solitude isn't about going into a space with our eyes covered, acting like the world around me doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It is going into a world where Christ came, this world into which he is calling and forming and sending his body. I thought that was really powerful because there really is this, this part for us as Christians that if, we, if the whole point behind it is just to become like Christ so we can look really good mm. and we can just be really cool. Ooh, I don't even think you can say those things together. Doesn't it sound so, awful? It sounds, I know. It, yeah, it's like to, 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 to look like Christ so that we can look good. So that we can look it's good. Like, Ooh, I know. You, know it. you can't say that together. <laughs> so, that just makes you choke. I know. And I think that's where, oh, I think that's where legalism mm. comes into place. That's where we see when Jesus talked to the Pharisees or he talked to those that came and questioned him whenever he would break the law or whenever mm -hmm. he would do something that was against the law, um, healed somebody on the Sabbath or he touched the leper that was unclean or whatever those different stories are, about four or five of those right in the Gospels. Yeah. Um, he, was, he always looked at them and called them hypocrites because they were doing the law exactly what the law said, but the yeah. point they missed the whole point. So he even says to one of to one of those situations that your lips are saying one thing, but your heart is far from me. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to remind us as the body of Christ that I think that's another part that we check our hearts in this, that why am I fasting? Why yeah. am I doing silence and solitude? Why am I whatever? Is it just to become this big spiritual giant so that I'm great? Mm -hmm. Or is the whole point that we are motivated to the call of God that's on the inside of us, that we are the body of Christ yeah. to this world? Yeah. Le you know, kind of the idea of less of me and more of him. There you go. Totally. So, good. so guys, I don't know. I think we could go on forever, but we probably ought to continue us this next week, huh? That sounds great. We do How have... How long have we been going? About 50 minutes. 50 minutes, yeah. 50 minutes, man. Are you all, your ears bleeding out there? <laughs> well, here's what I'll say, and I think that's a great point. So we do have a bunch of disciplines that we would love to continue to talk about. Yeah. Um, we've talked about some of these as a church, but we'd love to dive a little bit deeper into some of them and then maybe talk about some that we haven't presented yet. So we'll do that on our next podcast. But if I can leave us in a, a bit of encouragement, Pashlin, I'll let you leave us, but yeah. start somewhere. Yep. And let's utilize this season of Lent to be able to help create some rhythms that are not yeah. just for this 40 days, yeah. but that the lead us continue. into a continuism yep. of becoming like Christ. So, Pastor yeah. go ahead and close this I up. I thought it would be good. I, I pulled up on my computer here um, a prayer that was written in the 4th century by St. Ephraim. And it's a, it's, it's a prayer. It, it, it's something every, every time I read this and, and put it before the Lord... There's something in me to just that I just go, I wonder how many millions of people prayed this prayer mm -hmm. today, the same thing. And then I got thinking, and, and when God answers this prayer and, and begins to, we begin to see fruits of it in our own lives, what a change that can make mm -hmm. in how we deal with people. And it's in, so I'll just cool. end with this. O oh Lord and master of my life, keep me from the spirit of indifference. Man, it isn't easy, isn't easy as for us to become indifferent mm -hmm. to, the, to the plight of others, of, yeah. of things that are going on. Keep me from the spirit of indifference and discouragement. Any of us ever been discouraged this last week or the sure. last day? Yeah. Um, the lust of power and idle chatter. Instead, grant to me your servant the spirit of wholesomeness of being, humble-mindedness, patience, and love. Man, I need those things. O oh Lord and King, grant me the grace to be aware of my sins and not to judge my brother or sister, for you are blessed now and ever and forever. Amen. Mm. Amen. That's good. I like it. And that's a prayer that was written in the 200s. Yeah. That's powerful. Guys, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time at the table here at AGF. God bless. Bye. Bye.